Okay, hi. Um, so today we're, we're presenting the basics of zero knowledge cryptography and our domain specific language key law. Um, but, but first, um, before talking about zero knowledge proofs or ZKPs, we're going to um, introduce um, we're going to introduce proof of knowledge. So proofs of knowledge is something that you can show a verifier that you know something. And one example of this is a, a password. So if you want to let the verify, verify, verify your identity, you just have to show him that you know the password. And, but however, um, telling the verifier your password is, is very risky because they may, might leak it and it'll be pretty, pretty bad. Um, so this can be prevented by using another kind of proof of knowledge, which is, well, which is called zero knowledge proofs. So um, it basically allows you to um, show a verifier that you know something but without revealing um, any information. And there's a classic Alibaba cave example of how it works. So um, we have a cave with two entrances, and Alice somehow knows how to um, knows how to get over. There's a secret door at the back of the cave, and she knows how to go around it. And she needs to prove this to to Bob, but she doesn't want to tell Bob about the secret of this back door. So how does she? Do this, she would just have to walk in from, from entrance A and exit from entrance B. And that way, um, she can show Bob that um, she knows the secret. Yeah, so that's the basic idea of ZKPs, but of course, it's a, small, a bit more complicated than that. So there are a lot of applications of ZKPs. For example, you can use it to do identity verification, you can use it to to privacy preserving cryptocurrency transactions like Zcash. And also, you can use it on voting systems or medical and health records. So um, many ZKP protocols construct proofs from some computational circuits and models. And these circuits are often formulated with a bunch of polynomial equations or gates. And examples include R1CS or AIR. Um, but the problem is um, these DKPs are really difficult to construct. Take R1CS, for example. Um, it has a bunch of constraints which looks like this. So it's composed of three linear polynomials, and there are often like tons of them. And each of these constraints contains lots of lots of variables. So it's almost impossible to, to construct these proofs by, um, by, by, by hand. And that's why we need um, a programming language for ZKPs. Yeah, so that we can provide a higher level and more intuitive way to describe ZKP computations and make it easier for non-experts to work with ZKPs and also to abstract away the detail of the underlying protocol so that um, he or she can compile it into R1CS or ARA um, without really have to understand the underlying stuff. And in order to facilitate this translation, we also need a compiler for it. And this compiler would allow us to um, have specialized algorithms for optimizing the performance of these circuits. But the problem is um, not all languages um, will do. First of all, the language will have to supply, um, have to support really big integers. And then, um, it will have to prevent developers from writing, for example, infinite loops in their program. And also, um, it's not really a one-way computation, so it's actually describing a relation. So most general purpose languages are not just designed for this. So that's why we need something called a domain-specific domain language for ZKPs. And domain-specific languages, or DSLs, are programming languages that are designed to be used for a specific domain or application. And they're often really good at performing a specific task than um, general purpose languages. So the blue line down here is um, it's general purpose languages. You can use it to solve all kinds of problems, but they are not particularly good at it. And this red spike here is uh, DSL. 
you can only use it to solve a, a specific problem, but it's very good at it. So examples of DSLs include CSS. You can use it to style a website, LaTeX for typesetting documents, SQL, and also HTML. And yes, HTML is a proper programming language. So um, there are already um, lots of existing DSLs for constructing ZKPs, um, for example, Circom, Zekratis, Caro, or Noach. But all of them are standalone DSLs. That means that they have to um, invent their own toolings. They have to do all of the documentations and the, the whole ecosystem. And so the, the DSLs for ZKP, the, the whole community is pretty fragmented. And we are addressing this issue by adding yet another DSL into the mix. Yeah. And that's why um, we're introducing Keylong. So Keylong is a ZKP DSL embedded in Haskell. It's a general purpose functional programming language. And it also comes with a compiler that also written in Haskell. And it's based on um, Snorkel. It's a, a, an academic work by Gordon Stewart and his students, but we have rewritten all of its code. So um, have anyone heard of this language, Haskell? Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing, yeah. Okay, so why Haskell? The reason why you choose Haskell is because um, it's pretty expressive and it allows us to design um, the syntax and semantics of, of our DSL in a really natural way. So it's an excellent choice for embedding DSLs. And also it has a really advanced type system that can help um, users to enforce invariants and ensure that their ZKPs are correct. And also, um, the most important thing is probably of, um, its purity. So this purity, um, it allows you to draw a line and have fine control over um, what side effects are allowed in your language and what side effects are not allowed in your language. So um, I think no other general purpose language allows, to, allows you to design this kind of DSLs, and that's why we choose Haskell. And another advantage of um, embedding in Haskell is that we can leverage the Haskell's ecosystem. It, it's been around for like 30 years, so there are lots of tools and lots of libraries, documentations, and frameworks for debugging and testing, so it's, it's almost for free, so we're taking it. And it also allows us to um, integrate Keylong with other pieces of software. And I think the most important thing is that um, it allows us to tap into Haskell's developers and community because we be believe that um, Haskell's community is arguably larger than all of the other DKP DSLs combined. So we're tapping into that. All right, um, enough talking. Let's um, look at some of the examples of Keylong. So um, because since Haskell is embedded in that Keylong is embedded in Haskell, so it has all of the features such as functions and model system. We don't have to do it alone. And so we only have to maintain a really small and simple core language that provides the basic building blocks and a small interface for bridging these two languages. And so Keylong only has have three primitive data types. They are field elements, basically just numbers and booleans, and also unsigned integers. And it has a context for keep, keeping track of constraints on, on variables. And also it has a mutable memory for um, doing imperative mutable stuff. Yeah, so what you're looking at is um, a piece of really simple code written in Keylong. And what it does is it takes a field element as input, computes its successor, and outputs it. So it should be it should be pretty straightforward. But we can modify it a bit to make it more general. So we can, um, instead of just adding one, we can add an n. And we can use this add n function everywhere. And it's almost as if it's a, like a macro. So if, if you have written circum, and it's like templates in circum. And this is um, essentially meta programming in Keylong. And we can do this because we are embedded in another meta language called Haskell, and it has functions, so we can make use of that. 
And let's look at the control flows. We can also loop over a bunch of numbers like this because um, we have a lot of these combinators in Haskell for doing this kind of stuff. And you have loops now. Um, what about conditional branches? You can, um, in this example, we can take an input and see if it's equal to 42. If it's true, then we can output 100 or else um, zero. So we can do conditionals in, in kilons too. And finally, um, let's look at unsigned integers. Unsigned integers is like um, a demon baby of field elements and booleans because it possess both traits of, uh, traits of both um, data types. So you can do arithmetics, but also logical operations on it. So in this example, the developer is asking for an unsigned integer of 32 bits, and he's doing some masking. And if you look closely, um, you can see that there's a number in the types. And this is possible because um, Haskell has this kind of dependent type ability. So, so you can annotate these numbers in the type itself. And this way, we can provide um, developers from mixing, for example, um, unsigned integers of different ways together. And this can um, prevent um, a, a large, really wide range of type errors. And since um, ZKPs are all about constraints on variables, developers can, of course, impose um, constraints they want by making these assertions. So in this example, it would generate a constraint like this. And it's basically saying x will have to be equal to y. And finally, um, we have um, constructed um, a simulated memory for mutable arrays um, because we know that um, a lot of developers are more used to languages like C or Python. And these languages um, um, all have um, mutations and assignments. So we have put effect memory in it in order to cater to these developers. And also because there are a lot of pseudocode they're um, described in this way. Yeah. OK, and finally, um, we have designed an interface between Kilong and Haskell. And the reason why we do this is that we want to reuse as much existing Haskell code in Kilong as possible. And so um, with this sim interface, um, developers, they can specify how to compile their Haskell data types into Kilong data types. And this can be, be done automatically, so they'll have, have to only declare it once, and they can use it everywhere. Yeah. Um, finally, um, toolings. So um, toolings are very important because we want to make this um, ZKP construction as seamless as possible. So Kinon is also bundled with a compiler for generating circuits and an interpreter for testing and witness generation, and also Z ZKP prover and verifier. Yeah, so um, that's pretty much all about Keylong. And next, um, we're going to have some demos. So, Victor. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Victor. I'm also an engineer at BTQ. So now I'll be talking about uh, some demos. Uh, I assume a lot of people here already know what a Markov tree is. Um, so basically, it's a data structure built from a list of elements. And each node in a label of the Markov tree is a hash of two nodes in the next level of it. So basically, that's how you construct the binary Markov tree, right? Uh, a, and list, a list of four elements can be constructed into a macro tree uh, with three levels. And there will be a root, uh, which is the hash uh, that represents a macro tree. And with little knowledge proof, a user can prove that they know a hash that is a member of the macro tree uh, without revealing which one they know. Because publicly, everyone just know the root of the macro tree. They don't know. Uh, what members it has. So here's an here's an example of uh, how you write a proof of Markov tree membership in Circum, another language 
for uh, this kind of constraints. Uh, it, it's, the, the, the code is very tiny because uh, we are not going into the details here, but basically uh, it asks users to provide uh, a lift that is a member of the tree and a path from that lift to the root of the macro tree. So, and it outputs as a root. So basically the user doesn't have to uh, tell which, which macro tree it belongs, but well, uh, this circuit will generate it and the verifier after taking the root can check if the root is indeed the one they want. So let's, let's see how it looks like in Kilom. So this, this, this program basically does the same thing as the program we just see. Um, you can see it's much simpler, it's shorter, because we make use of the fold, the fold construction in Haskell. Um, if you don't know what the fold is, uh, I'm sorry I can't explain it right now, but just here to show that it's kind of simpler. Let's see a more complicated example. Um, a semaphore is a protocol that allows, uh, it's, it's semaphore is not something that you can you see in system programming, but it's a, not, it's a protocol that consists of groups that store identities of users and numbers that represent events such as votes. And this protocol allows each user in the group to send a signal corresponding to an event. And it has some constraints to uh, satisfy. First of all, it's verifiable, it's veri uh, verifiable such that anyone in the group can know the signal is sent by someone from the group, but also it's anonymous. So nobody can know which extra member sent the signal. And uh, furthermore, a signal corresponding to an event can only be sent once and only once by a user. How do we satisfy these um, conditions? In practice, a user sent a proof consisting of their identity and which consists of two numbers. And of course, the proof of membership. These two proofs uh, are basically something you, you will provide uh, in the previous macro tree example. And uh, third, the event they want to signal, that is the random number I just mentioned, that represent an event. We call it external nullifier. And of course, the signal message itself, that's a string. And how do you verify the proof as a verifier? So if you are a smart contract or server, you take the root um, that is supposedly is where the user belongs, and the hash of uh, an identity of the user and the external neural file that represent the event, such that the verifier can store it somewhere and check if the signal, uh, if that user has already sent the signal before, because the, the hash here is unique. And everyone can only has one of this hash. And of course the event uh, that's happening and the signal message that is public and the verifier can verify the, the message is actually sent by the user. And the proof, the whole proof that's uh, provided by the user. So this whole constraint is kind of, com is kind of complicated. Uh, this, uh, this image is from the, circum uh, is from the uh, designers of the protocol. They wrote the program in Circom. So the whole program looked like this, um, which make use of a lot of like hash functions uh, and some other function, some other calculations that's uh, not, show, not show here. But here is the corresponding program in Kilon. So as you can see, it's much simpler. I'm sorry the code is very tiny, but we can see the actual code here. Uh, here's a symbol for court. I split it into two functions. So um, in general, yeah, I think it's, um, it looks much simpler to me. So let's do some quick demo. How do you um, verify, how do you verify a program? So for example, if I can. Uh, <laughs> can I do it? Okay. This is how you hash, 
how you hash a, uh, uh, let's say, how you generate a member of the root, of the, of the Merkle tree. And we can also um, Uh, so here, there, here's an example of generating a tree. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five elements, and we want to generate the root of this. Um, uh, we want to generate a Markov tree from this list of elements. So this, uh, this function basically uh, generates the root of the Markov tree. And now we have the root of Markov tree, that is this number. We can um, use another program we just mentioned, that is the membership program. Um, so get Marco proof. It takes, let's see the program itself. Here is the gate, get Marco proof. So it takes a lif, a member, and it takes the path, we call it siblings, because, um, well, siblings is are the paths. And the, the siblings and index, index this is, can be seen as a, a uh, different representation of the path from the left to the root of the Merkle tree. So in total, uh, these inputs are provided as the, um, third, uh, the second argument of the function, gf181. It's basically an interpreter that interprets the function. So we, we are just demo to run the program here. He, the list here is what a user should provide. But in practice, the user sh should not provide it to anyone but themselves only. So here, generates the root of the Merkle tree as a same as the one we just constructed. And what if we want to uh, run the program to run the semaphore program that says, um, so uh, the semaphore program basically verify the signal is actually from someone in the group, right? And it checks that the signal is sent only once. So you can see here, it, it outputs the root of the Merkle tree. So um, the point here is that you can compile, what, uh, the, you can compile the, these programs into constraints, right? All we want is our one CS constraints. These are just demos that um, what will actually be generated if the inputs are given. But before the inputs are given, we need constraints. And to compile a keylong program, uh, we just use uh, our compiler here that's also written in Haskell. And gf1a1 is a field we select. It's basically a number. Um, and as same for here, you can see this program, same for prime, uh, and takes three numbers correspond to the semaphore program on the left hand, side, left hand side. And this is this type represents a keylong program. So we are compiling a keylong program here. And it generates a bunch of constraints. OK, so here are the R1CS. Uh, uh, and you can do, so F, uh, with this constraints, you can use other uh, tools as about zero knowledge proofs and to um, construct applications. So that's my demo here. Okay, thank you, Victor. <laughs> um, so after demo, we're going to um, discuss um, the future roadmap of Keylong. So because there are a lot of things that we want to do in Keylong, and um, the first thing is hardware acceleration. And the reason why hardware acceleration is important be is because that um, ZKP, um, it's, it's very um, computing in intensive task to, to generate a ZKP. And that's why um, we want to have a specialized hardware for, for doing this. And so we have a hardware team working on, on those hardwares. And so we're thinking um, maybe we can add a new backend in Keylong for targeting this hardware and allow it to perform specialized um, optimization specifically designed for, for our hardware. So that's hardware acceleration. And also um, ZK Playground. So if you have tried 
other DSLs like SOCOM or the Crates, they are, are some existing ZK playground. And they're really nice because it allows you to, um, to create ZKPs with, with just a few clicks. And so we want, also want to have a web-based web playground that allows developers to, to write Keylong in their browser and generate all these ZKPs with just one click. And, and this allows um, us to reduce the mental friction of, um, so it, um, for, uh, sorry. So um, with DK Playground, we can reduce um, developers' mental friction of taking the first step because, you know, it's always the most difficult step. And, and finally, um, we want to support more proving systems because um, Aside from R1CS, there are now um, a lot of new proving systems and protocols, and such as Plunk and Plunk2, or Plunky, Plunkish, that kind of stuff. So, and so we will want to have new backends for it, and also zk stock. So, um, yeah, that's um, that's a few things that um, we want to add to Kilo in the future, and now. Um, We'd like to pass the stage to our partners at Holonym who are using Kilon to build their DID protocol. Yeah, let's welcome Nanak from Holonym. Hey, what's up? Um, thanks for the amazing demo, BTQ. Um, and yeah, thanks for inviting us up here. And uh, thank you, uh, Taipei, Blockchain, Taipei Blockchain Week as well for this awesome event. So uh, we wanted to give a little demo of what you can do with um, Keylung. So we're going to walk you through what we built with Holonym. So as a quick demo to see a uh, use case. So I'm going to give a little overview uh, first of what Holonym does and the problems that we're setting out to solve. And uh, also going to go over a little recap of the cryptographic primitives that were discussed in the, the previous talk. Um, and then tie it all together with like a little video of uh, everything coming to action to identity protocol. So Holonym is a ZK identity protocol. Right, so you can prove facts about your identity without revealing them. And uh, there, there are lots of use cases of that. So the, the specific ones that we're focused on are, are one, KYC, because all through crypto, there's becoming increasing need to verify your users, whether it's for like regulations, proving someone's in a certain country, even outside of Web3, proving someone's above a certain age to get like alcohol or access websites. And then there's also a huge bot problem uh, all throughout the web, uh, we want to prove that people are real people, um, and you know, unique people that can't act multiple times. And in crypto, this becomes monetized when bots can make a lot of money by farming airdrops and uh, you know, <laughs> uh, DAO voting, etc. So, another really interesting use case of zk identity um, that uh, that you can build with with, um, with tools like uh, Keylung is wallet recovery. So you can prove that you own certain web accounts or identities without revealing the identities. And then essentially once you've proven you're yourself, you can um, you know, then recover your wallet ideally. So the crypto cryptographic primitives we employ to do these tasks involve pre-image proof. So um, if you're not familiar with the concept of a pre-image, and just the input to a hash function. So hash function takes as input a pre-image, it gives as output a digest. So you want to, uh, you know, the digest is publicly known, but you want to show that you know that private input that makes the hash. So this is used like, honestly, the bread and butter of a lot of applied ZK. Um, so for example, uh, we want to show that we know some private credentials that are on this public Merkle tree, because everything on blockchain is public, uh, so you can have this public 
digest and you, you prove you know some part of that digest. So you prove you have some valid credentials that have been inserted into the blockchain. And uh, how exactly are credentials inserted into a blockchain? So um, we use a, uh, a Merkle tree, uh, as Victor covered earlier. Um, so essentially just a hash of everybody's identity, uh, then recursively hashed up until you get to the, the root, which is, contains a hash of everything. So the cool thing about a, a, a Merkle tree, this is used a lot in Zeek applications, is uh, you know, like Tornado Cache, Zcash, um, every Zeek identity protocol, uh, you can prove that you know a specific element which, uh, without revealing the element. So this is what we use to prove that you have a valid identity, that you've passed some sort of KYC, but the person who verified you for KYC can't tell who you are. Um, they can't track your address. So just to see how this works uh, in action, Uh, so here we have a standard KYC process. You scan the QR code and uh, you know do a selfie check, the ID scanning, and then you can uh, submit this proof on chain. So we call this uh, minting your hollow. Oak. Then here behind the scenes, it's adding your credential to the Merkle tree. So then after you've minted your hollow, you can prove facts about yourself. So for example, the, the facts we currently support proving about yourself um, include uh, unique personhood and US residency. And so like this is, for example, if you want to claim an airdrop and you don't want bots to be able to game the airdrop, uh, you can prove you're a unique person. Um, or if it's like quadratic voting, for example, then you can prove you're a unique person. Or if you want to have a DAO that's a democracy, where it's one person, one vote, instead of uh, one token, one vote. Right? So um, yeah, those are some, some use cases of it. And uh, we've also aimed to abstract away um, a lot of the complicated stuff. Like, uh, I mean, so obviously, have you seen the previous presentation? It gets pretty complicated behind the scenes. Um, but we want to make it easy for regular developers to use, um, you know, tools like Keylang and Holonym. So uh, then you can fetch the result uh, just with a simple API call, and it calls it from a, a smart contract, right? So this tells you whether somebody has a soulbound token uh, saying they're U.S. resident. And uh, yeah, this example um, lets you fetch a soulbound token, like whether somebody has a soulbound token saying whether they're a unique person. So yeah, um, hope you enjoyed. If you want to learn more about us, then uh, here's our, our Twitter and our website. And uh, yeah, um, if, if nobody, yeah, I mean, wait, how much time do we have left? Okay, great. So uh, should we do a F, uh, FAQ, I mean um, Q&A? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, cool. <laughs> cool. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, anybody have any questions for either BTQ or Holonym? Okay, cool. What's up? Okay. <laughs> So after somebody scans their driver's license and sends that in, is that like, is the process of verifying that's an authentic document outsourced or do you guys do that yourself? Yeah, so that's outsourced to like a Web2 solution. Um, so the idea is like anybody can be um, an issuer of credentials. So um, you can use like existing Web2 solutions or you could have like some sort of DAO or whatever. Right now we, we made the first issuer with just like a standard Web2 solution. Um, and then uh, afterwards it's kind of wrapped in this like privacy layer. So whoever um, you verify your ID and, and you scan your documents with, they can't track your, uh, your future activity on the blockchain because they won't know your address. And about the Merkle tree, if you wanted to prove that you had one element of it, right? If you wanted to get to that root hash, wouldn't you need to know every single piece of it in order to piece together all the um, underlying nodes before the root? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great question. So. Um, 
so all the, all right, cool, yeah. Yeah, just to give a little context uh, to that question, um, uh, for anybody who's not as familiar with uh, Merkle trees, the way uh, Merkle proof works, right, you want to uh, show you know this element, you have to also show this element, you show that these two um, hash to these, or sorry, you have to, <laughs> if you want to show you know this one, then you need to know this one and this one, right? Then you show that these hash to this, you also have to know that, you show these two hash to that, and then you also have to know that, and you can show both of those hash to the root node. Um, so, so yes, you do have to know the neighbors. Uh, the thing is the neighbors are essentially just random strings to anybody except the people who know the, um, the pre-images to these. Um, so these are like where the secrets are. Uh, you only need to know like this level um, of everybody else's uh, leaves. Because uh, the whole Merkle tree is uh, on-chain, so it's all public. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, also, there's one thing that I forgot to mention about, about Keylong is that um, we are planning to open source it so that everybody can get their hands on Keylong and try it. But we are still working on its documentation and licensing that sort of stuff because we want it to be ready when it's available. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so um, thank you. <laughs> uh, any more questions about how name or key long? Yeah, no? Okay, um, thank you everybody.